Hello and welcome to D2C Podcast. I'm Eric Dick. Today we're excited to have an incredible guest, Nicholas Bornling, who has masterfully woven the art of storytelling into the fabric of branding, transforming iconic brands like Solomon, New Era, Keen, Houdini, and currently Craft Sportswear, a trail running brand, cashing in on the newish wave of niche purpose footwear headlined by billion dollar brands on running and Hoka. In this episode, we delve into the pivotal moments of brand evolution and the power of a compelling narrative in shaping a brand's journey. We'll explore the intersection of brand identity and performance marketing and the crucial role of storytelling in creating an authentic and engaging brand experience. You'll hear all about Nicholas's eureka moment where he realized everything is a story and how it revolutionized his approach at Solomon and Houdini. You'll hear all about him crafting iconic brands, how he transformed these outdoor brands into cultural icons, blending innovation and captivating stories. And you'll hear all about the future of branding and why you should never call what we make content. Instead, we should focus on how it's a fusion of brand storytelling and strategic marketing, not just content. Speaking of changing words around, Nicholas also pitches me on changing the name of this podcast to direct to user, which reflects his philosophy and approach while he worked with brands like Houdini, where the focus is on viewing customers, not just as consumers, but as users who actively engage the product. I'll take it under consideration, but I already have the hat. So join me as we uncover these insightful perspectives with Nicholas and on with the show. I refuse to use the word content when it comes to valuable brand storytelling. I think that as soon as you use the word content, you've gone wrong. Because the definition of content is something that fills a void, right? It just fills an empty space. And and I, when you look at the stories that a brand is putting out there, it should never be viewed as filling a void. In any company that I have ever worked for, any brand that I've ever worked with, one of the few things that I hold sacred is to never look at anything that we do for marketing as content. Ready to expand your marketing strategy into CTV ads? Roku, yes, the same Roku that powers nearly half of all TV streaming in the US has just launched a game-changing self-service advertising platform custom built for CTV performance. Introducing Roku Ads Manager. Roku Ads Manager was built with growth marketers in mind. Roku's CTV algorithms optimize your ads in real time, effectively reaching your target audience at scale. Meanwhile, interactive action ads, our integration with Shopify and other performance features, make it easy for you to run ads for your viewers to convert directly from their Roku remote or mobile phone. It's easy to set up your first campaign. Head over to advertising.roku.com slash DTC and get started today for as little as $500. It's time to take your CTV ads to the next level with Roku Ads Manager. Nicholas, welcome to the podcast. I'm super excited to have have you on here. You've worked with some of my favorite personal brands, some of the brands that I've seen do some really amazing things in the in the outdoor space over the last little while. Give me the main thrust of your philosophy around brand that has allowed you to work with with these amazing brands. Yeah, uh, thanks, Eric. Um, happy to be on your podcast. And um, let's just start out with a with a bang immediately and we can go from there and dissect um, everything what I'm just about to say. I uh, am a firm believer that good marketing is 90% storytelling and the other 10% is amplification of that story. But if you don't have a good story, it really doesn't matter how much you amplify it. It's a little bit like, you know, you put shit in and uh, if you amplify it, you'll just get more. 100%. And I think one of the things I see with the brands that you've worked with, specifically like Solomon, and any of these, any of the world's biggest brands is that the stories that they tell are really pared down and really simpler. I think people, you know, in our audience, like, you know, our audience is a lot of performance marketers. We're always thinking of different angles and ways we can drive commerce with our, with our social ads. But when it comes down to like the core of a brand and its identity, I imagine you want that storytelling to be pretty simple. A hundred percent, Eric. You know, the the noise that we have around ourselves today um, and have have had for quite a while actually is just insane, right? So what what people need is less, less stuff, less messages, um, less people that reach out to you and more time to 
more time to think, uh, more time to reflect. And I think that brands have <clears throat> a role to play in that one. There's an aspect of responsibility that comes in in being a brand. Um, I know we all want to we all want to sell more and make more money, um, which is which is great. But I think there's actually a room for brands that are respecting uh, people, people's time. And I think brands are responsible for um, telling great stories that we want to connect with. Um, because as human beings, uh, we want to connect and we want to believe and we want to be part of something bigger. And uh, that, that may be the the simplest way of defining a brand at the end of the day, right? Um, my thoughts are very often sort of circulating around the idea that a brand is, is bigger than the product that it sells, that a brand is an idea that, uh, that people want to be part of. Um, and the more secret that is, uh, the more you're not allowed to be a part of it, uh, the more you want to be a part of it. That, the exclusivity, right? So, as a, I mean, there's so many learnings that I've had in my uh, in my career so far. But you know, go home and and always tell yourself or ask yourself the question like, how can I how can I tell a great story that people uh, want to be part of, that people want to connect, that people want to listen to, and and take that seriously. Talk a little bit about how you put this into practice. We'll talk a little bit about your your history at Salomon. It's one of my one of my favorite brands. They've had this huge glow up recently in the in the outdoor space, verging you know into mass culture. They're probably like the coolest shoe out there, and they're they're kind of an extreme shoe. There there there's no shoe that looks like them. You know, if you tried to if you were trying to wear them in the early two thousands, people might have called you a geek uh, because they you know they're so bright and a little clunky. But talk a little bit about your tra- your your early days at Salomon, what you transitioned to, and then what you brought to that brand in terms of storytelling. Well, I, I hope that I've brought something, Eric, but um, I, uh, I want to start out by saying that there are hundreds and thousands of absolutely brilliant people that have walked through the doors of the Annecy Design Center. Some of them remain there and lots of new people have come in and, and taken that ball farther and further away. But when I joined was really at the end of the 90s and uh, I joined locally in Sweden. By the way, I, I am from Sweden um, originally. So I, I was really, really lucky getting a shot at, at Solomon at the time that Solomon was in. Uh, end of the 90s, the beginning of 2000, so much happened in, um, in the outdoor space. So many new things were coming to fruition. Um, I mean, this was the time when snowboarding was exploding uh, all over the world and if you were a teenager you wanted nothing to do with what your father and mother was on which was two sticks right um standing yep. might as well be telemarking <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 telemarking was kind of a thing in the 90s actually in the 80s too but um yeah you know skis uh, so snowboard exploded at that time and and you know, if it wasn't for snowboarding, I don't think that skiing would be what it is today. Um, snowboarding has so much to do with how skiing evolved as a practice, uh, inspired uh, youth to, to ski differently. I mean, skiing went from being solely inspired by uh, ski racing to a tool that you could take to a snow park, right? To a half pipe, to to jumps, transitions, rails, and, and whatever it could be. Um, that exploded right at the end of the 90s and beginning of 2000 through uh, a, a very special partnership between Solomon and um, uh, the, the Canadian Air Force, which was you know really led by this amazing guy called Mike Douglas, who uh, has a lot of impact on the Solomon brand overall. I think about um, snowboarding too and how much it changed the fashion. Like I, I think when I was skiing in the nineties and I remember the, the Desante one pieces and, uh, and I, and snowboarding comes in with a lot more, uh, you know, street, <laughs> streetwear sort of style. And I, and that's really bled into skiing as well and made it, made it cooler f- for it as well. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I mean, not only did it inspire how you were, you know, uh, skiing and where you were skiing on the mountain, but also how you looked 
what you thought, what music you were listening to, uh, what fashion you adhere to. It just changed everything uh, for the better, I have to say. That, so that was part of what happened. Uh, many other practices exploded at that time. Solomon got behind it. And I, I, think, I think what makes Solomon so unique is the um, curiosity that has been inside that company since day one. And, and I believe it's still there. Um, the curiosity to explore new things, new ways of, um, of enjoying outdoor, the outdoors, whatever that may be. Um, Salman got behind ski across uh, early in, uh, early 2000s, end of 90s. Um, that became uh, a discipline in the X Games. And, and if it wasn't for Salman's commitment to the sport, it, it would never have become an Olympic sport, which it is today. Salman um, invested heavily into adventure racing. At the time, it was also called multi-sports. The, there was these big races you would go from point A to point point z over the span of a week and you would you would use you know your feet or, or biking or um white water or whatever it may be this huge areas that you would cover and um someone created the um uh, the adventure racing world cup at the time and i think that's where the discovery came from uh that that there might be something in this idea about running off the road running on trails instead uh, we could see that the teams that were winning adventure races at that time were winning those races uh, during the uh, the hiking portions of it, right? Um, which became more, more and more of a foot race. And, you know, teams started running and they started asking Solomon for shoes that were runnable uh, on, uh, on trails and sort of just off-road in general, like lighter and faster equipment. Um, and there was this pivotal moment where uh, I, I remember us sort of getting together and just saying, I, I, I think it's time to pivot. We, we could see s small pockets in like Austria, Spain, areas of the US where, you know, sort of ne this niche sport happened and started taking root. And, you know, fr from there on until today, people ask me, you know, so what did Salmon do? And, and how is it possible that Salmon is, is so incredibly cool today? And I mean, it sort of all culminated with Rihanna stepping on the stage with a, uh, a Salmon snow cross in collaboration with a fashion brand. And how did it go from, you know, making ski edges and, and winter sports equipment to that? And, and I, I think what I, what, I, what I keep saying is that it's, it's because of um, all the uncool things that we did for many years in the hidden that nobody saw that has created a library of stories so once again stories right that we're now able to or, or Salma is now able to just basically explore and uh, dive right into and and bring those things back into um, into culture I'd, I'd be interested to talk about the hierarchy of the stories in an organization like Solomon at that time. Like, because to me, Solomon, right, when I got into skiing in the nineties, like Solomon t in Canada, I think it was perceived as like the, like the pinnacle, if not, if not one of the top two brands in sport, like it was the, it was the most expensive, the best technology. Uh, and I feel like that's, that's such a, like, that's really carried over into, into these shoes. They're like, there, you just have this sense that they are more technical than other shoes because of this like legacy of like really high, uh, you know, high production value. And then the other aspect that I love about them is they've really embraced maximalism in some ways, I think, because there's been a huge minimalist trends or, or a CPG uh, uh, blands as we call them. But I feel like Solomon really stands out in terms of its design and obviously in terms of the technology that goes into it. I, I think you're right. I think that there has been certain design elements, and I'm, I'm probably not the best one to speak to this. There's uh, a lot of people in, in Salmon Footwear that probably would be better to talk to it. But th there's been these hallmarks of a Salmon shoe that stayed on for a very long time, such as the sense fit, sort of the, the pattern on the exterior side and the, and the medial side of the shoe, the power band that sort of wraps your heel the quick lace um, 
system, the lacing system that I, that is still there today, uh, and many other aspects to how do you define the design DNA of, of a Salomon shoe. You know, they they are designed together with mountain sports athletes. It's uh, I mean, it, at the end of the day, Salomon is at its best when it does mountain sports innovation for mountain sports athletes. And I think that's what you see in, in shoes and uh, the other successful categories coming from Salmon. Um, it's this commitment to the athlete, to the mountain sports athlete. I'm on their Who We Are page right now, and it's as it's loading, it's showing mountains, so I'm, I'm with you there. Specifically, give me an example of some brand stories at, at Salomon. Or, and I don't know if, they're, if you have them in a hierarchy, like in terms of what, what's the most important brand story and what are some of the brand stories you kind of told when you were getting into into cross country into the into the uh, the outdoor running space well i mean once again when i was there right which is now a long time ago i left 10 years ago um so lots have happened but uh i mean stories that we were telling um were either athlete driven sports marketing as someone refers to it uh which is both athletes and events uh, and innovation stories product innovation stories um it was all hinging on a an umbrella uh, that I, that I mentioned a little bit earlier about mountain sports innovation for mountain sports athletes, and from there we drew inspiration for our storytelling. And some of the best examples of that is you know athletes like Kilian Jornet, um, the trail runner, the Spanish trail runner, that joined Solomon uh, when I, I don't think he was much more than sixteen years old at the time. Uh, discovered by Salomon Spain uh, and, you know, pretty quickly rose to be the most prolific mountain sports athlete of all time, if not one of the best endurance athletes overall, every sport included. Our storytelling around his attempts to not just win races, which he did pretty much all the time, but also setting fastest known times, right? Running around the Tahoe Rim Trail, uh, running up Matterhorn and uh, and documenting that, right? Documenting it and telling those stories. We were really early doing that. Um, the other aspect that uh, we launched a long time ago, I, I can't even remember when it is, but let's say it's somewhere around 2007, potentially, that Salmon launched Salmon Free Ski TV, which is um, a, a prime example of great brand storytelling. Um, it, it was a bunch of guys uh, coming together, um, just to name a few, Mike Douglas uh, was pivotal to this whole thing. Um, there was a guy, Bruno Bertrand, who's still there, Ben Edon, Benjamin Edon, to say it correctly in French. Uh, and uh, we were getting together and we were sitting and looking at, like, how are we, how are we supporting ski movies? Uh, and, and, you know, it was the same sort of like ski production companies every year. You would negotiate with them. You would, uh, in return, get uh, a logo placed uh, somewhere around the video and the movie. That would go on a tour. And then you would have an opportunity of, you know, setting up a little booth and showing off your products. And if you're really lucky, you would get an athlete placed as well in the ski movie. And, and for that, someone paid a lot of money. Uh, but what what we got out of it was really questionable in terms of our storytelling, right? Because we shared that space with multiple other brands. So there's nothing unique about it for Salmon. Um, so I, we were sitting together, and I think Mike had flown in from Whistler at the time, and he's probably been thinking about this idea. And we were many of us that were thinking the same and just saying, "We gotta do something about this." And and somebody in that room just said, Let, "Let's just launch our own." YouTube digital media based channel and we'll call it Salmon Free Ski TV and we're going to make X episodes per year and it started out I mean in the beginning we I think we had like 10, 10 episodes it became 15 episodes and I don't know if we ever reached as much as 20 which was way too many at the time um, and it got scaled back afterwards but we we pretty quickly had a lot of views. I, I mean, just within a few years, we had amassed something like a million views. And then you started looking at um, how many eyeballs we were reaching with that versus sponsoring an existing ski movie out there. And, you know, obviously this completely blew that out of the water. And 
we owned uh, the media, we owned the connection, we owned the story overall. It still remains today, right? It's a long, long time. It's, I mean, it's coming up on 20 years soon. I can't believe that's, that's not, is that even possible? <laughs> You're ahead of the curve on being a media company uh, as, a, as a brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could say that we didn't set off to become a media company. That was never the intent. The intent was to, to tell great athlete-driven stories in the space of, of free skiing. And within a few years, that inspired Solomon Running TV that came to free skiing. So all of a sudden, we had two channels. I think those two have been fused since years back now to Solomon TV, where the whole sort of span of the brand uh, comes into play. But I believe that's a prime example of, of great brand storytelling and, and also owning that channel and owning the connection. And now, I mean, pretty much every ski, snowboard, outdoor running brand has their own YouTube channel, right, and produces content. And I'm going to park that word content, Eric, because we, we'll, we'll have to get back to that in a while. Um, I said it on purpose just so we, we need time to discuss what that means. That's where I wanted to go next if, yeah, if, we're, if we're ready to jump. Because the, the dip, it's funny, like I think we live in, in this world where everyone's putting out content. You know, we're, At D2C, we're putting out uh, an enormous amount of content between our podcasts and our newsletters. Um, how do you differentiate between content and brand story and like really compelling brand story when you're, when you're talking about a marketing strategy? To me, I, I, I refuse to use the word content when it comes to valuable brand storytelling. I think that as soon as you, as you use the word content, you've gone wrong because the definition of content is something that fills a void, right? It just fills an empty space. And and I, when you look at the stories that a brand is putting out there, it should never be viewed as filling a void. Yeah, content just for content's sake, right? Exactly, yes. So, I mean, in any company that I have ever worked for, any brand that I've ever worked with, one of the few things that I hold sacred is to never look at anything that we do for marketing as content. It's um, such a generic word. It's like the contents of a shipping container. It's it, it, it and words matter. It's it's actually very interesting because I just did a podcast with uh, someone else you're working with at Houdini, and they were expressing the idea that it's funny that they don't like to call uh, consumers. They don't like the idea of, of saying, "Oh, these are our customers or our consumers." These are our users. So they were suggesting I change the name of, po of the podcast to "Direct to User," which for most of the brand, for all the brands I think you've worked for is far more accurate than to say "consumer." You don't really consume apparel or skis; you use them to make your life better. And so I think I think it's a really neat thing that we can start thinking of better words to be using in these situations. A hundred percent. It is exactly uh, in the same vein, right? It, it, it belongs in the same discussion. The fact that, that we marketers refer to marketing assets or brand stories as, as content is one of them. The fact that we use the word consumers in this day and age of, of terrible overconsumption, overproduction, and I, I have worked at Houdini, as you know, Eric, and um, that discussion when we decided to change from D to C, right, to D to U, is very natural to Houdini. Like, nobody would even question that. You know, of course, the people um, that buy our products should be looked upon as a user that is using it. Uh, and then when when that's over and it's been, you know, that, that person has been using that jacket or, or the pair of pants, then, then it goes on to the next user and the next user. And then, you know, eventually it cannot be used any longer. So at that point, it needs to be taken back and recycled so that it can go into the circle so we don't extend that line. But I'm, I'm digressing and coming off a little bit right now. But words matter, Eric. You said it and I, I'm with you on that 100% right? You know, let's choose the right words for the things that we're doing. Let's, um, let's put the stuff that we're doing on a pedestal. 
uh, serve it with white gloves because if we don't treat it like that, the people that are working inside brands, then why should anybody treat it any differently out there? It makes and it fits in with what you said right at the beginning too about wanting it, wanting your brand to be a club that like not everyone gets into or that it, and, and I, I look at Houdini specifically and there's, there's this sort of countercultural sort of theme running through them. I think it was on, I was on their LinkedIn page. It was like, whether you're getting together for an outdoor event or to start a revolution, it's better to go with people. And so, and, and they sort of have this like countercultural, uh, you know, mentality of, of being against overconsumption. All their products are meant to last for, you know, for generations. They're all, you were explaining to me a little bit about the fabrics, about how I, I didn't even realize about fabrics waste like how much how much fabric waste of from like fast fashion gets you know micro particles get launched into our atmosphere every year from o- the overconsumption of cheap clothes um, and how brands like this are kind of putting a flag in the sand to say you know we're not that we're we're, we're not going to want you to buy you know 100 of these shirts you need you need three of them in your wardrobe maybe for the next 10 years um, like a Fremen suit in Dune which is what I feel like when I wear this but that all goes to it, it's you're not only doing it to turn customers away, you're, you're doing it to also just to build this like exclusivity and the story around your brand so that people would want to be a part of it. 100%. I mean, I'm obviously an enormous fan of Houdini. It is one of the most beautiful ideas that has happened in our space in the last 20 years. I wish more people would know about Houdini and the ideas and the people that are working there because not, not only is the brand beautiful, but the people that are there are amazing people uh, doing amazing things. And you referenced it earlier as well. We talked a little bit on this other podcast, but their concept of circular production or circular design, where you're kind of managing the end-to-end life cycle of your products and their impact rather than just dumping them off uh, to the landfills, which I think is something, and it's been a theme of this podcast since we started. Like almost every, so many brands in so in North America, I think a lot of brands are are they're finding different ways to stand out and and come across as ethical, whether it's climate pledges or or things like that. But I but I feel like really embracing something like this principle of of circular design, circular production is sort of the the really the next step in like quality capitalism in a way. Absolutely, I tend to use analogies a lot um, overall, and um, and one of the analogies that we were using at Houdini was that Houdini was this kid that was standing at a train station um waiting for the train to come in um and has been standing there alone in rain and wind and cold and stuff for years and waiting and waiting and waiting um and now i think we're hearing how the train is pulling up at the train station you 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 hear the sort of the squeaky uh brakes and and stuff like that and it's, it's it's approaching the train station and the difference is now is that the Houdini is not standing there alone. Uh, there is now hundreds and thousands of other people that are uh, much bigger, much stronger, sharper elbows with first class tickets. And, you know, is, is Houdini even, you know, standing there for, for so many years and waiting, is it even going to get on that train? And I, I think you understand my drift here, Eric, right? You know, that the train is pulling up is, is a train of what's refers, referred to as sustainability today, uh, and everybody wants to be part of the sustainability train. And, uh, and there are ways of paying yourself onto a, um, you know, a business class or, or first class ticket to get on that train. But have, are you really doing the things that are necessary for a company that uh, labels themselves as sustainable? So there's another word that I, I believe we should... Um, stop using you know in our space and uh and instead start using the word responsible which word should we not use uh sustainability sustainability because it's just it's too general it has too much too many abil- yeah there's, there's different ways to approach that but yeah i mean there's two two aspects to that eric you know first and foremost the word has been dragged in the mud yeah um and it's uh it, it's now a generic expression for somebody who's trying to do the right thing or may not be trying to do the right thing but you know so green washing is definitely part of the the space of sustainability overall and and the other aspect to it is i'm not really sure exactly what sustainability really means to a business so i, I think i think it's time to 
to instead start using that we are conducting a responsible business, right? Where we are responsible for every aspect of what we do as a company and a business. The product is, is part of that, right? But there are many other aspects to running a, a responsible business. I wanted to save some time to dive into the running shoe space. This is this is something I've been, I'm a bit of a shoe head myself. I, I do like to run, got a, a different different set of runners for different different things. I bought a pair of Hoka's, which I just love. And, and I've you know been a huge fan of the incumbents for years, whether it's Nike or Adidas. And they they've just had a, a real stranglehold on the running industry or on the on the footwear industry for so many years. But to see just in the last you know five years, or as far as I'm concerned, probably maybe a little bit before, there's been this explosion of these challenger brands that are filling specific niches in the running and outdoor space. Um, this is a world that you're now firmly a part of as a fractional CMO of Craft Running, Craft Sportswear rather. Uh, talk to me a little bit about becoming, well, you've been a part of the space for years, but talk about what you've seen, I guess, over the last uh, three years in this space. I mean, I, I think you have to probably extend that time frame a little bit more than the last three years. I, I think you have to go back 10 or maybe even 15 years for that matter. And I mean, I remember at Solomon, we were looking at the running space with um, like, I wouldn't say fear, but a lot of respect. Could we actually be a running brand? Right, you know th these discussions were going on all the time, and then we entered into to trail running and and sort of you know were a part of building the trail running community to what it is today. But the running was was a you know was inspired by road running and track and field. Like that was the space, right? You walked into any running specialty store, those were the brands that you find on the shelves in there, and there were no trail running footwear brands at the time. So like we were, we were sort of like very respectful of that space and even using terms like, you know, running or road running or any of those aspects. And, you know, people kept saying that there, there is, there's no room for another running brand. And by the way, trail running is a niche thing done by half naked, long haired, bearded guys in the outback of, of Colorado or in Montana or in Utah in desolate places, it's it's not it's it's not something that you should really care about, and and all of those things prove to be completely wrong, because there's plenty of space in running. There there are ways of carving out a niche that we would never have imagined at the time. I mean, now trail running has become a pillar of a running specialty store. You walk into the doors and there's going to be a part of that wall that is dedicated to trail running shoes. But the, not, none of those things are surprising any longer. You would have looked at that 15 years ago, it would have been an impossibility to even imagine that, right? And now, you know, since the last five, 10 years, people have been saying the same thing. Now, you know, okay, so you've got road and track and you've got trail and and all that there's no there's no more room right there's no more space for another running footwear brand there and then in comes um hoke and on and i don't know exactly their revenue numbers but they're both well north of a billion dollars yeah in like when did hoka start even hoka founded 2009 so they've been around for a while yeah same same with on on has been 2010 and, and it, it's worth mentioning that the founders of Hoka are all ex-Salmon people. Jean-Luc was the president of Salmon uh, during a, a long period of time, the most innovative, visionary, creative period of Salmon's time was under Jean-Luc's leadership. Um, and when he left Salmon, um, one of the things that he did was started um, uh, fixing and, and, and bringing to life this idea about a shoe that would mimic the same sensations and benefits as a powder ski would do, which was to float on top of snow uh, effortlessly. Um, and this was in the, the minimalist period of time, right? Where, you know, um, Vibram Five Fingers and uh, the book Natural Running came out and everybody read that and started running barefoot around the place and got hurt. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and Jean-Luc's idea and Nicolas' idea was the opposite, the counter opposite, right? And in that period of time, it has grown to become, uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the biggest 
specialty running brand uh, in the US uh, running specialty. It's absolutely insane, right? In about a decade. Like, yeah, that's it's uh, to, to go into a market. Yeah, like like that is is unbelievable. And on as well, like to, they're at they're at one point two, one point two billion, one point four for Hoka. And then I, I imagine one of the biggest challenges in this space is the shoe store. Cause I, it's like anytime I've bought a pair, like I bought a pair of runners, it's quite often you're going to these shoe stores and it's like the, these, the people who sell shoes at shoe stores, like really know their stuff. They have the stuff they sell. I imagine getting on shelf and getting into their, into their, what they're recommending is one of the biggest challenges in the shoe space. Yes, absolutely. And, and the thing is that selling in is different. It's difficult. No question about it but it's possible, right? The, there's always going to be the, 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 the store or the shop or the buyer at the shop that, that wants to try out something new. The real difficulty is to sell through. And I think that way too many brands in this space and, and many other brands um, pay too much attention to selling in and, and too little attention to selling through. And then is it literally just about educating? Is it about going in and whining? Is it is it like is it like pharm- is it like pharmaceuticals where you're like whining and dining these these people? How do you get it? How do you break into the selling through aspect of these of this in store environment? Well, I mean, there are two ways really, or potentially three ways now with uh, with with Hoka and on coming on the scene. But you're either brand that is generating consumer demand yourself, right? The, in general, these are bigger brands. It's the Nikes and the Adidas of the world, right? That just creates demand and people will be aware of its presence and probably already think that they that's what they want to have, right? When they go running. So these are brands that are driving traffic to any kind of outlet in general. Then there are the brands that are seeking to get the recommendation of a third party. And there are really uh, amazing brands in that space, such as uh, Brooks would be a, a great example, right? Uh, Brooks is a brand that very often people will walk into a, a running specialty store and just basically say, "Hey, I'm 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 this person. I run like that, and I, you know, maybe I'm a supinator. I'm not really sure, but you know, what would you recommend me to to use?" And uh, a Brooks is a brand that has done an absolutely stellar job of educating stores, of providing solutions to people with different kinds of, um, of problems that they need to be solved through their, through their running. And there are other brands in that space that are doing a very good job, right? So, and then there's the third category, which is brands that are completely disruptive, that, that are you know, disrupting the whole space and bringing a, a wow sensation to everything. That's your hokas and the ons. And so that's another way of, of doing that. But, you know, those brands will probably seek to evolve into something different in the future. So if you're not a big brand uh, with, you know, the means, with the time, the awareness and the capability of, um, uh, of driving demand, then you're going to have to go through uh, gaining the recommendation of the people that are working in the stores. And there is many different ways of doing that. Obviously, I don't think we're going to get into the, the details of that, but it's at the end of the day, you can summarize that by, by getting shoes on feet. You have to get as many of your shoes on as many feet that is ever possible out there to gain recommendation from people that are working in the stores, but also other runners, right? Recommendation, recommendation, recommendation. It reminds me too, just thinking of this third category of brands like Hoka and On, uh, to something Tony, uh, a friend of mine who runs Vessi, a waterproof shoe company in Vancouver, that's just done you know huge, huge numbers. And it was he was talking about silhouettes of shoes. And I feel like Hoka, when they came in, it's like they kind of reinvented a silhouette to have that huge, huge outsole. On obviously totally changed the silhouette by adding you know all those interesting uh, little grates in the in the bottom of, of the shoe. Uh, and so just by changing the form factor, I think that's probably a big way that you get into that third category. Um, and now you guys are just with craft, you're in a similar situation because you're in that silhouette category. You're in kind of that Hoka large outsole category. So they've kind of paved the way. And now you've got to find a way to carve out space on those same shelves, I imagine. A hundred percent. And gain the recommendation of the community, the running community at large, right? 
so you know you walk in and you present craft and the people are going to ask you so okay cool I've, I've, I maybe I've heard about it maybe I haven't heard about it the shoe look good um, it, it aesthetically is is already pretty mature and you have to remember the craft running shoes is uh, is a very young thing it's been in the marketplace for about two years the product itself has existed for five years only so it's still a very young uh, category for for craft but it's already aesthetically really, really pleasing. It looks good. Uh, it's driven by a Scandinavian design uh, sensitivity of minimalism and only the necessary components, the functional aspect to it. Everything that you know about Scandinavian design comes to life uh, in the shoes itself. Uh, and then comes, okay, so but what makes it different from a... Uh, from a practice standpoint, from a feature benefit standpoint. And I, and I think what craft is sort of like really honing into is this hybrid space between trail running and road running. And it's, it's smart because most runners will, will not be a pure road runner or a pure trail runner. They, they'll run on multiple surfaces, right? The, most runs will include a little bit of gravel, a little bit of, you know, easy trails, and uh, there'll definitely be a road component to your run as well. So having a shoe that delivers really well for that in-between sort of hybrid position uh, could could be that point of difference that uh, could carve out a specific niche for craft to come in on. I like it. It's funny. Those are the two I have. I run at a trail, like a, a five kilometer trail just by my house here. Um, and I have trail runners for it, but I prefer the the swimmy feeling of the of the Hoka. So I'm always debating between my trail runners and my Hoka. So I'm a perfect use case for why craft uh, makes sense in the market. I wanted to ask uh, just about with, we've talked so much about brand. We've talked all about um, the retail environment as well. What's your position uh, as a fractional CMO of craft on direct response marketing in its role? Because I, I know I'm sure most shoes are sold by people wanting to actually try them on, but where does direct response fit in, in your sort of worldview? Can you just define direct response? So, so I'm not. So uh... direct response would be is performance marketing where it's like, you know, you're, I'm going to spend uh, you know, $50,000 this month on meta ads, and I'm going to drive, you know, $80,000 in sales. And then the LTV will take me to, you know, like basically the sort of driving sales, uh, on, on social media platforms through ads. Yeah. Uh, obviously we have our DDU. That's right. Well, that's what we're calling it. That's right. Yeah. That is, um, it's, it's, it's performing quite well actually here in the U S uh, overall. And it, it is a component of, I mean, the overall purchase journey. Like, so I think that in general, there, there's no way as a brand that you can be just a pure player in in the footwear space, the running footwear space. Because, so, you know, any purchase decision will include multiple stops in that journey. Then that may be in wholesale specialty, that may be through recommendation, that may be through digital that may be through a visit to a social platform or for any other own media platform that the brand is having. So Kraft uh, is, is looking at the DDU component as a, an integral part of the overall purchase journey. Whether or not that journey will end in, uh, in owned media or at a wholesale is a little bit less relevant to the brand as it sits right now. There is a pretty heavy emphasis on on email in the company. The first stage of uh, of growing the running footwear uh, category for uh, for craft is to get people that is already aware and already using the brand, right? And the, the brand's been around in in first layer, in running apparel, in cycling apparel, and other categories for quite a while. So there's already a community of people that is aware and, and using the brand. It's actually one of the OGs of endurance sports that exists. It, it stems out of Nordic skiing. So getting those people to convert and, uh, and buy running footwear is the first step. And that is done through uh, CRM primarily and also through email marketing. And there is a, uh, a sizable paid budget and a paid strategy to to craft as well. So by no means are we a pure wholesale player. 
at, at a high level, we talked about hybrid. What are you, in terms of not content, in terms of storytelling, what what kind of things are you focusing on in order to, to fuel the ads and, and fuel these stories, essentially? Um, athlete stories and product stories. Kraft has actually built out a pretty impressive athlete team that is generating stories through either um, participation to running events like the UTMB in Chamonix uh, or the Western States or um, the Boston Marathon for that matter. I don't know if you've heard of Tommy Ribs, but Tommy Ribs is a long time athlete that has been with Kraft for quite a while and he went through some pretty serious medical issues. Um, came back with, I believe, just 10 or 15% of his lung capacity and still uh, ran uh, ran the Boston Marathon. That's awesome. With only that. And, and that's one of the things that is generating storytelling for, for craft um, and also the collaboration between product development and the athlete itself is another aspect to it. We well, like that. Nice. Well, let's... I have one one final question here. If I were to give you a hundred thousand dollar grant uh, for Craft to use in your in your marketing budget, how would you how would you think about using that? Would you be putting it into stories, or would you put be putting it into what would you be putting that into? If if that money had to be spent immediately, uh, I would put it in um, in gaining recommendation from running specialty in programs that enable. Um, us to have a a direct connection to shops that are that is carrying craft footwear today. That would be where I put it in. I would put it in ambassadors that are working closely with those stores and the local running communities that surround those stores as well. I would aim as a as a short term objective um, to gain the recommendation in a geographically limited area around those stores that are carrying it that's that would be the very first thing that i would put the money in sounds like a good use i talk so much to performance marketers and um you know you know basically basically people in this performance marketing space and i think your perspective as someone who's kind of worked on so many high level brands would be something really interesting to our audience if people want to follow your journey potentially get in touch where do you recommend they do that on linkedin maybe uh, yeah, that that would probably be the best place to to reach me at. Uh, at one point, I need to put the time in and 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 uh, create a website for myself. But you know what it's like, right? Oh, yeah, marketers are uh, the worst at marketing themselves. It's true. It, I, it's, it's something I really want to focus on in 2024. And I've 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 heard a bunch of a lot of rumblings about how important personal branding personal branding within, you know, B2B branding is within the space. And I've, I've done, I've, my whole career has been some element of that, but I think 2024 is the year I really try to embrace it, get, get more, get even more in front of the camera. Cause I'm not on the internet enough. Yeah, dude, that's a whole other podcast that we could do. It's the sort of the, the uh, amazing explosion of just normal people that have realized uh, that they may be and may become a brand that they can monetize that themselves and that brand isn't a thing that belongs to large corporations like Coca-Cola and Apple and Nike, but it can be, uh, can be yourself and you can monetize it. And that's a really interesting space that I'm spending a lot of time thinking about, right? You know, the rise of influencers, right? The, the rise of uh, the athlete brand, mm-hmm. the celebrity brand, uh, all of it's, it's absolutely amazing. And, and the opportunity for that, Eric, in the D2C space, as it's just the beginning, it's just starting to scratch the surface of it. Well, nice. We have our next topic. Perfect. Yes, that would be fun to talk about. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming on today. We'll have you again back soon. Good luck with everything on the craft side. And I, I yeah, I'm gonna I, I'm not changing the name of the company just yet. Uh, but uh, but low key, I'm 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 stewing on on the on the user idea versus consumer because it just makes more sense. Totally, do it, Eric. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter, you can do that right now at direct to consumer all one word dot co. I'm Eric Dick, and this has been the D2C podcast. We'll see you next time.